We have several big stories today, and I've got Mike Benz with us who can discuss every one of them with uh, a certain granularity and expertise that few people can. Yeah, Mike Benz has founded the Foundation for Freedom Online. He is one of the best advocates we have for free speech uh, on the internet. And we've got some big cases that have come down recently. We're still waiting for the net choice case. Uh, but then, Mike, we just got Supreme Court decisions on the January 6th case, as well as Chevron. I think we should ju just jump into this. Can we start with January 6th? Yeah, I know that the case just came down, so we haven't had a chance to read it, but this is a big decision. It's huge. I mean, it throws a it throws a monkey wrench into hundreds of Justice Department cases, which were all uh, very manipulatively constructed by the Justice Department, essentially to send a message uh, to supporters of Donald Trump and effectively, as I see it, to kill, quote, Trumpism after Trump. I think that there are a lot of open questions about what actually happened on January 6th. Um, for example, there is the the only uh, mass casualty event threat of the day, these uh, the pipe bomber, which was the fixation of all uh, of effectively all coverage for the for the first several months because we were told this person threatened to blow up both the GOP headquarters building and the DNC headquarters building. Um, we still, to this day, three years later, over three years later, not we don't know the age, the race, the sex. We uh, there's been no new video clips produced of the 39,000 video files they have of this person since September 2021. Even though this person walked on barefoot through the panopticon of Cap of Capitol Hill uh, for an hour and a half, part of it actually in broad daylight. They uh, still have not found a single skin cell, hair follicle, uh, and even appear to have blurred the eyes on some of the footage. There's a lot of open questions about the role of the FBI, the DHS, and the and Army counterintelligence and Mark Milley's role in this, um, as well as Nancy Pelosi's. And so you've had this very, uh, you've had this huge gravitational pull around domestic terrorism, domestic extremism, with a lot of open questions about what actually kicked it all off. And uh, it's my belief that the over-prosecution of January 6 was uh, in intended to essentially offset the underlying investigation of what actually caused it. And these, the, you know, this uh, obstruction of justice charge is an attempt to essentially stack 20 years worth of conspiracy charges on everybody who uh, happened to cross their foot over the line of what's normally a public, uh, a public building, uh, just as you know what with Justice Kavanaugh when he was being nominated, and you had obstruction there from uh, from protesters who entered the building and did chance to uh, you know delay the hearing. There were actual delays, but this was this idea that if you delayed it for a single minute, the um, the bicameral vote that day on January sixth, then now you are subject to twenty years worth of stacking charges. And that had the effect of driving this whole media campaign that that this was this massive felonious event rather than ordinary course trespassing. Yeah. Well, Mike. And so, yeah. Mike, you and I have both worked in the executive branch as political appointees. Uh, I was in the Bush administration. You were more recently in the Trump administration. Some people who would hear this might think, "Well, this kind of, kind of sounds a little conspiratorial." Mike, let me just tell you. Uh, I ran a federal agency for two years, and it, it's shocking, but in the two years' time that I ran that, that agency, the career bureaucrats, if you count up allegations of, of uh, misconduct, of violating the APA, of, uh, et cetera, all, any kind of con misconduct you can, you can think of, they filed 2,000 different accusations against me over the course of two years. This is the career bureaucracy was doing everything they could to make my life as miserable as possible so that I could not provide leadership to the agency. Fast forward to the Trump administration and this same career bureaucracy is not merely trying to hassle and harass the political appointees. They are trying to imprison them. You know, tell me about your experience and that what leads you to be able to conclude uh, you know, what is going on against J6 as well as, and then we get into big tech censorship and collusion with the Biden administration. 
Well, they're all sort of connected. I mean, you can make an argument that the in-person demonstrations that happened on January 6th were, were perceived to some extent to be a necessity because you can talk about it online. The fact is, is the huge amount of censorship, everybody who had a problem with mail-in ballots and this completely unprecedented situation where seven states flip overnight and it goes from being a landslide victory to a very narrow loss in the in the dead of night with with no oversight. And anyone who had talked about it from issues with these magic midnight mail-in ballots and the unaccountability for them, no signature verification in many cases, no proof of citizenship required in many cases, um, these all sort of being counted in these sort of large Democrat blue city places like Philadelphia or Detroit. And yeah, you had this situation where you couldn't talk about it because the Department of Homeland Security, uh, our DHS, which is only was just set up to stop another 9/11, grew this capacity to be able to censor domestic speech by simply saying elections are critical infrastructure, and so misinformation about elections on the internet is a cyber attack on critical infrastructure. They basically use this this uh, this magic ability to then create a web of cutouts in the private sector to work with the tech platforms to censor anybody who, who challenged that. And so, you know, you had that around the January 6th, but the FBI itself had just constructed one of these one of these false flag, uh, you know, attempts with the very same militias, the three percenters, which is one of the three big militias on January 6th. Just three months prior, the FBI had entrapped uh, over half a dozen people in in Michigan to uh, to to do another sort of you know insurrection against the the governor of Michigan. They'd even sold them fake pipe bombs. This was under Stephen D'Antuono's watch. He was the head of the FBI field office uh, for Detroit, and who was then magically promoted to be the uh, special agent in charge of the the Washington D.C. office right before January six. Um, you know th- this is this is a tale as old as time. When you want to eliminate somebody who is your uh, political opponent, your pro- your political arch enemy, and you control various levers of the government apparatus, then you can weaponize those elements. They were flat busted right before January six happened. So the fact that there are all these open questions about January 6th to me is not a good look. Yeah, but Mike, you know, you're saying it's a tale as old as time. And we can point to abuse in our own government uh, in different decades. But the abuse that we are seeing now is so systemic and so rampant. The intelligence community, you know, we're supposed to rely on the intelligence community to keep us safe. But it seems like they've turned their sights on us internally uh, instead, and you know, just new information has come out about Clapper using his official government role to help the Biden campaign manufacture, concoct these terrible stories. Um, you know, you, uh, I, I'll give you credit. You can, you can disabuse me if I'm wrong, but I think you're the one who's come up with the term "the blob" for all of this. It, it goes beyond the deep state. The, you know, what is it that you know about the blob, both the IC, you know, the intelligence community, as well as bureaucrats and how they're colluding against us? Well, technically, the term was actually coined by President Obama's deputy national security advisor, Ben Rhodes, to describe how the presidency often felt powerless against the thick bureaucracy of not just the deep state of Washington, but all of its various tentacles in the private sector and NGO space. And I think that um, that Ben Rhodes's concept of the blob there is very useful to be able to understand uh, perhaps even from the other side of the political aisle or in a sort of almost bipartisan way. This is a, a situation where the, the blob that he was referring to there was the foreign policy establishment, which is within the government. It's localized in the Department of Defense, the Department of State and the intelligence community. So you basically have the Pentagon, the State Department, the CIA and all the other soft power institutions that are that get funding from from those uh, from those vectors, and then you also have the corporations and financial firms who put downward pressure for policy to uh, to to be carried out by those uh, by those agencies. And the the nasty thing about the blob, the foreign policy establishment, is that it is deputized to have this Department of Dirty Tricks. You know, this is a a term that George Kennan and some of the CIA godfathers would sort of jovially refer to as their capacity to do very nasty things abroad because it's a nasty world out there. And so you can do things to other countries for the benefit of U.S. citizens. For example, you can 
rig elections as we did in 1948 in Italy. You can bribe media organizations to run or kill stories, true or false, you know, as we have done and still do to this day for 80 years now. You can uh, fund political dissident groups. You can take over universities and unions and all of these things that if somebody else did to us, we would throw everyone in jail and pass sanctions on the sponsoring country. But because you can argue it redounds to U.S. citizens' benefits. You know, it gives us cheaper gas prices. It gives us export markets for our corporations, et cetera. Uh, they're deputized to have this foreign-facing Department of Dirty Tricks in order to serve the U.S. citizens who live here. The issue is, is especially in 2016, and you can argue there were flare-ups throughout American history before this, but it really became – consolidated as a weapon to use against Americans after the 2016 election, when the same foreign policy establishment, our CIA, our Pentagon, our State Department, began to use this Department of Dirty Tricks to rig internal politics. And a lot of this was because Donald Trump's foreign policy was a massive reversal of almost 80 years of, con of bipartisan consensus that had existed from Truman to Trump, you know, a, a detente with Russia, pulling out of Syria, uh, questions about NATO, pulling out of NAFTA, pulling out of the Paris Climate Accord, get it, pulling out of the Iran deal. All of these things, one after another, were essentially rock'em, sock'em, robot punches to the blob. And the issue was, is there was no way to stop it if the population was voting for it. And so they turned this very special set of skills uh, on the American public. And this is what we saw with, with what you just referenced. This was the DHS domestic intelligence unit that was set up under the Biden administration. And, and it was run by John Brennan and James Clapper. John Brennan was the head of the Central Intelligence Agency on the day that Trump was elected. So the outgoing CIA director and the outgoing head of the entire ODNI, the Office of Director of Na National Intelligence. This is all 17 intelligence agencies that, um, that Clapper was in charge of, again, on the day that Trump was inaugurated. So the outgoing CIA chief and the outgoing chief of the entire intelligence community, whose jobs are to do drone strikes on people in foreign countries, whose jobs are to rig elections and to do all the underhanded, plausibly deniable cloak and dagger dirty work that the U.S. government doesn't want to get, wants to do but doesn't want to get caught doing publicly. They then shift into a domestic focused intelligence group where they specifically say that their target are supporters of the former president. And now they also use January 6th as the predicate. And they argued that basically these First Amendment protections of, of, of the U.S. government putting its thumb on the press of social media companies, doing all this domestic monitoring that James Clapper was caught perjuring, to, you know, that, that he claimed didn't even happen in the first place and then was busted when Edward Snowden uh, made made the revelations that he did. So not only you know, was he calling to, to sort of bring that back or to, or to use that, but to double down on it and effectively wage the sort of counterinsurgency campaign against Trump supporters that they were used to doing against ISIS and Taliban supporters in Iraq and Afghanistan. And that is really, you know, this Department of Dirty Tricks turned inward. Yeah. So, Mike, you know, here at the Media Research Center, you know, we've uncovered lots of documentation about what has been going on out of the Department of Homeland Security. The targeted violence and terrorism uh, grant program was using our tax dollars, supposed to be catching terrorists, and instead was training people on how to infiltrate the Heritage Foundation and Prager University and the Trump campaign with our tax dollars. And and uh, and it's you know the State Department working with the, uh, the, the U.S. Embassy in Germany and Würzburg to train U.S. teachers on how to propagandize kids in what you and I know as media literacy, uh, and then how the, how the Homeland Security Department then supercharged that effort to bring that training across classrooms all over America. And time and time again, the Biden censorship regime is huge, and now we've just got a Supreme Court decision, the Murthy v. Missouri case, which you know, some people have, I think, inartfully simply described it as uh, the, the court reversing the prior good decision uh, based on a lack of standing, when in reality, the Supreme Court basically said there's so much censorship going on by the Biden administration that the Supreme Court itself is not competent to be able to identify 
all of the harms connected to the censorship, so Amy Coney Barrett let stand the Biden censorship regime as we are heading into the election. So this, this whole James Clapper, you know, intelligence community apparatus and all of these federal agencies engaged in censorship, they're allowed to continue this censorship. Now, I know you haven't read this case yet, but my God, Mike, what are we going to do to stop big tech censorship and the collusion and collaboration with government? Yes. So <coughs> forgive me. Um, this is one of these things. I, I've read a lot of takes on it, and I'm, I'm still yet to line by line, it, as, as you noted. And so I'll probably have an updated take on this once I've, I've gone through the specific minutia. But based on everything that I've, I've read on it, there, I, I always try to sort of stay enthusiastic uh, on, on these things because there's, there's only so much that you need – Frankly, there's only so much that Merrick Garland's Justice Department would even would even enforce judicially. A lot of a lot of our work in terms of taking on the censorship industry can be done with or without whatever the Supreme Court's current ruling is. Um, creating civil uh, lines of action, as the states of Florida and Texas have done, um, creating pressure to be able to pry these censorship mercenaries off of their institutions, uh, using. Uh, you know, the, the legislative power to be able to hold hearings and investigations and subpoenas and essentially raising the cost of doing the censorship business are all things that don't rely on a Supreme Court, you know, slam dunk decision. And the other thing that I note here and correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that this is essentially a ruling on a preliminary injunction and that there will be years of discovery uh, that that are still you know, pending on this, and there will eventually be a sort of final state of play. And I think that at that point, uh, it's quite possible that the Supreme Court will will essentially be forced to hear it once all of the discovery has come in. And I think that a more powerful argument can be articulated uh, with with all of that. So I've not given up hope in in any way on on the case, even though this. This hearing is, you know, this result is not what we would have wanted. Uh, I think the most damaging aspect of it is the time sensitivity in light of the election. In fact, in 2020, some of these federal agencies involved in censorship work uh, believed that what they were doing was illegal under the First Amendment, and so deliberately structured things using cutouts and and using uh, these public-private partnerships in order to offload onto the onto these sort of newly constructed pop-up censorship firms, the work that they wanted done. And it could be that with the Supreme Court case, they will now feel brave to do that you know, themselves and to not have to go through all the logistical hoops. So you know, in that sense, uh, that's obviously a very nasty thing. Uh, but I actually think that the way the case was argued between the oral argument and some of what I saw in the briefs uh, could be an awful lot sharper and needs to be really simplified for the court to understand. And if I can just use the, before I, I pause, let me just make one more point, which is that I, I believe that the attorney generals bringing this case really need to understand and make simple for, for the Supreme Court for two years from now, whenever whenever a final you know judgment uh, on, on the full merits is made, about this concept of the whole of society, the whole society framework that the government uses, which is this idea that they are deliberately using the the private sector, the civil society organizations, and media and news checking fa uh, uh, fact groups as part of what they call a sort of modern model. You know, uh, it's where the government has this permanent place as the quarterback of these other elements of society to all align them on censorship activity. I also think that that the that the attorney generals really need to bring a sharper focus on the concept of knob downturning and knob upturning of, of things, because I think the justice, the, the Supreme Court, I think, does not want to make a an overly broad determination that people in government can't talk to people in the media because any suggestion that something is wrong or incorrect, you know, if, 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 if you talk to a New York Times journalist and you say, hey, that this story is false, does, is that coercion to a New York to the New York Times and telling them, you know, basically threatening them with government coercion if they don't print it? Uh, you know, th these are the kind of things that that simplifying frameworks really need to be used because there's this whole field of a censorship industry that the, the 
the clerks and the, the staffers at, at, at the Supreme Court don't really have the time and energy to be able to get a crash course PhD in. But I actually think that gives us an opportunity, people who are media watchdogs, people who are investigative journalists, uh, to be able to actually provide that firepower so that a much stronger case can be brought when the, when the merits are, uh, are reached on the case. And I actually do think at that time, um, the, the evidence will be so overwhelming that uh, we may be able to actually get a, a win on the merits. Well, Mike, thank you so much. You are a great champion for First Amendment free speech rights. You're a great ally in our effort to push back on big tech censorship. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. And thanks for your leadership as well. I want to invite you as my guest on a very special once in a lifetime, seven day post-election cruise in the Caribbean. Caribbean. It's going to be a blast.